My name is Danica, and we're so glad that you have joined us um, for this first one of our fall. Uh, we hope you had a great summer and are gearing up for all things craziness <laughs> uh, in, that, that fall brings. So we're so excited that you've joined us. We've opened this third Tuesday conversation up to people who are um, network members and also to a wider audience of people who might not be members yet. But uh, we're hoping that you'd continue to join us monthly. So we hope you've grabbed your coffee. Uh, we've got Meredith Gould with us today talking about the social media gospel. And um, Meredith, welcome. We're so excited to have you. No, I'm so excited to be here. I'm holding up my book. Can everybody see it? Just kidding. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, just as a reminder for those who it's been a while, um, and for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, please, we want this to be an interactive conversation, so please submit your questions into the box on the right-hand side of your screen, and um, we'll pass them along later in the broadcast. Um, you also can tweet directly at Meredith, um, Meredith, at Meredith Gould. Am I saying that correctly, Gould? Pardon? Am I saying your last name correctly? Gould? Yes, it's Meredith Gould. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Awesome. Well, um, before we jump in, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and uh, what, you're, what you do when you're not um, keeping the World Wide Web informed of all things uh, social media and church? Oh, I do nothing else. <laughs> I have no other life. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Well, I'm a housewife, and I uh, cook, clean, and sew. What? No. Um, oh. <laughs> I, I actually spend um, just about all my waking hours online doing something. It's my community. It's my church beyond the building. Um, I also tend to treat Twitter as my personal stand-up comedy club, as <laughs> people who follow me know. Um, I use Instagram and Pinterest as my happy places because I started out as an artist, so I spent a lot of time there. Um, all kidding aside, I actually do love to cook, love to cook, so do that. And um, when I'm not doing social media, I'm consulting about social media to churches and judicatories, and I'm usually either recuperating from writing a book or thinking about writing the next book. Every time I finish a book, this is something my friends laugh at me for now. Every time I finish a book, um, I I vow I am never ever doing this again. This is awful. It's stupid. It's gruesome. Never again. And then you know the pain kind of starts to heal after a month or two, and I start <laughs> thinking about the next book. So now people just laugh at me when I say never doing that again. So uh, the social media gospel was my ninth book, and I'm um, starting to think about the next one. So that's what I do when I'm not online and trying to micromanage the World Wide Web. Awesome. Well, um, like I said before, we're so excited to have you with us today, and um, I have been personally uh, super jazzed about your project, the social media gospel, and so. For people who haven't read it or um, who want to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, if you will, tell us a little bit about your book. Nice. And <laughs> I'm not calling you that, of course. <laughs> um, but tell us a little bit about the book. Um, tell me about the project, um, what you maybe learned through the process of writing, um, whatever you'd like us to know about right. this latest gig. Okay. Well, the book... Um, to understand the book, you need a little bit of a framework, and I'll try and do this quickly. And that is, I've been involved in marketing communications for decades, um, long before social media as we now know it was invented. So I've been involved with that for decades in the secular world, and then starting around the late 80s, into the 90s, I got involved with uh, communications for mission-based, faith-based communities. Um, the turn of the century, which means around the year 2000, I then got involved specifically with a local church as a part-time pastoral associate for communications and, and had that job for three years. 
as a result of that, I ended up writing a book called The Word Made Fresh, Communicating Church and Faith Today. That book came out in 2008, which meant I wrote it around 2006. I've been thinking about it prior to that. And in that book I wrote because I realized that I was in ministry and that communication is a ministry mm -hmm. and that it's a ministry that involves having secular skills as well as spiritual gifts. And at the time, I seemed to be, and you'll note how modest I am, at the time, I seemed to be the only one who seemed to know that. Um, mm -hmm. So I became very hot on trying to explain to people in the world of church that Church communications is a ministry, um, and it's important to engage professionals, even if they are volunteers, even if you can't afford someone on staff. But there are, it is a professional ministry, and just as you wouldn't say, hey, you, you who looks interested, why don't you become the director of music? Um, you wouldn't, why are we doing that with communications? In fact, I recently said to someone who was being what I considered kind of stupid about communications. I said, oh, and so tell me, do you, do you go up to your organist and tell him or her which stops to pull out, which pedals to use? I doubt it. So why are you trying to tell that? Why are you, why are you treating your communications person that way? Mm -hmm. So in 2008, I wrote that book. And it came out uh, just when I was getting heavily active in social media in its contemporary form I was involved with what I call social media back in the 90s. And I was kicking myself for not writing, including information about social media in that book. And then I fell to my knees and thanked God, because it has really taken me two or three years to figure out why it's so valuable and how to use it and when to use it. So the social media gospel is not a how-to book. It does not you know, how to turn on a computer and set up a camera. <laughs> this is a, this is a yeah, like, plug it in, folks. Um, so this is really, I was determined to write a book about why and when to use social media. And so that's what this book is about. I didn't, you know, I just did not want to write another book that was going to be obsolete because the platform was going to, the platform has changed so quickly. So that's that. That's the, that's the, um, I guess the etiology is the social media gospel. Um, what did I learn while I was writing this book? I learned that I never want to write another book, which is why I started another book. No, I, um, I actually had a lot of fun writing this book uh, because when I wrote it, I had already been involved with the Chisakam, the CHSSCM online chat community on Twitter for a couple of years. Okay. And there were just so many, um, you know, people asking questions on that chat. I thought, hey, you know what, let's just put it all in a book. Um, so that's that. That's the story of that. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, little insight to that. Um, I just love this slide, and we <laughs> talked about this yesterday um, <laughs> in our preliminary conversation, but... Um, you don't have to use social media. You just don't just don't prevent others from using it. And um, I think that there are a lot of people, especially in the church, who uh, use the classic line, "We've never done it that way before." Um, and so I wondered if if maybe we could have a bit of conversation about this. That um, when you're talking with people about the social media gospel and about communicating the gospel. Uh, wh why is this picture important to you? <laughs> this is my hissy fit slide. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a slide I created because I really got tired of people saying, well, I don't use it. No one should use it. Not on my watch. I don't understand why. This makes no sense. It's alienating. You know, just fill in the whole list of complaints, complaints and disorders about social media, and I created this uh, slide because I basically wanted to say to people, look, and I do say this um, in, in person when I'm doing workshops, look, you don't have to use it. In fact, with, I, you know, with all due respect and uh, prayerfully, I don't care if you ever 
use it. Sure. Just don't stop other people from using it. Yeah. Um, don't don't block it because what we have in social media is and, and these are tools. That's the other thing. People confuse strategy and tactics with tools. These are tools. Mm -hmm. um, and these are tools that allow us a, a range of reach and a depth of connection that is really unprecedented. Um, and so why wouldn't you want to use, if, if you're committed to sharing the gospel, mm -hmm. if you're committed to ministry, if you're committed to seeing and being Christ in one another, why wouldn't you use every available means around? Sure. You know, why wouldn't you use everything out there? And so the resistance to social media and all the complaints and arguments against it, um, I would say probably 99% of them are fear-based. Mm -hmm. They're based in fear of change. They're based in, and, and the change is at two levels, and this is something I'm spending a lot of time talking about and thinking about. I haven't done much writing about it yet, but um, people are afraid of change that involves learning new things to do. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are, are just adverse to that. I mean, and these are people who either won't, won't switch from a manual shift, a manual transition, uh, transmission to a gear shift, or vice versa. You sure. know, there's, there's just a resistance to learning something that involves a technical skill. But I think the other fear that's going on is a fear of uh, cultural change. And what I say in the social media gospel, and whenever I have an opportunity to say it, like now, <laughs> is that what has happened with, with digital, the digital world has also transformed the way we understand time, which means that it has also transformed what we understand as responsiveness, as presence, and, and all that. So I'm a sociologist by education and training. My doctorate is in sociology. I look at everything through that lens. Mm -hmm. And so social media, these tools are like a sociologist. They, you know, I'm a happy, happy person because I look at these tools and I see how they are really um, changing or having an impact on the sociocultural map. Mm -hmm. And so many of the things that we understand, the way we understand small group process, the way we understand interaction, and all that, all those social dimensions, and to some extent the psychological dimensions that go with them, are being significantly changed by the world of digital. And that level of change freaks people out uh -huh. in general. It especially freaks people out in the church, and I love to quote Phyllis Pickle, you know, who in the great in the great emergence, she wrote that book, How Christianity Is Changing and Why, and she points out how you know every 500 years the church has some big attic garage sale where everything <laughs> gets reviewed and a lot of stuff gets thrown out and new stuff gets born, you know, the rummage sale, and you know, first chapters when the church cleans out its attic. And she says this happens every 500 years, and she claims we're in the midst of that. I would agree with her. And I think that when people get all freaked out about digital ministry and social media, I always like to do a little bit more work with folks and to, to tease out what is the real fear. Because sure. if it's a fear of just learning something, that's easy to fix. It's like, that's not a problem. We'll sit down, I'll get you jazzed up with coffee and chocolate. <laughs> we'll have some fun. I'll teach you how to actually do this. If it's a fear of change in church and change in culture, that's a longer conversation. That is more, that's a deeper process and one of discernment about what does it mean to be church? What does it mean to minister? Sure. And why are you so freaked out? <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, in your book, thanks for um, for going there with us about the, the fear piece. Um, in your book, you have a diagram that um, you call the trajectory of engagement. And right. um, oh, yeah. right. I'm wondering if you could walk us through that and, and tell us um, how you move people from one place to another um, 
and how it might translate into um, talking about this with others who aren't here today. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, I came up with this chart after I have been involved with social media for probably I don't know why maybe two or three years. I guess I'm on Twitter for five ish years, LinkedIn for six ish years. You know, but it's been a while. Mm -hmm. Started all mushed together. But um, and I'm also I would also like to point out that I also am very involved. Less so now because I'm doing more work with churches, but for many, many years, I also have an interest in an involvement with the healthcare industry, patient education, um, physician education, caregiver support. Um, I'm very, very interested in that health space, you know, where health and faith intersect. Mm -hmm. um, and I mention this because when I first got on Twitter, I was very active in PIXM, the healthcare social media conversation. One thing led to another, and I was invited onto the external advisory board of the Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media and have done a lot of work with them and helped develop their curriculum for their social media residency and so forth and so on. The trajectory of engagement I developed during that process because I started to think about, well, how do people move through this? When people mm -hmm. say, oh, it's alienating, it's not real, it's not true, what I started to say, realize is, no, there is a conversion. There's a conversion to deeper engagement. So you might start out, if you look at that beginning of the arrow, social media interactions lead to email exchange, lead to phone conversations, lead to a face-to-face -face meeting. The fastest conversion experience, <laughs> other than the one with Jesus, which took quite a while, actually, but the <laughs> fastest conversion, <laughs> conversion experience yeah, that's another story. You know, I raised Jewish, so you know, it's not like I grew up loving Jesus. You know? uh, Anyhow, um, the fastest I think ever happened was probably in within twelve, maybe maybe thirty six hours. I went from an exchange on Twitter to a phone conversation with someone. Hmm. That was very very fast, very fast. And when that happened, that started me thinking. Okay, how does this happen? Um, at this point in my life now, you know, five or six years into, again, the contemporary form of social media, social media as we know it today, I would say that most of my closest friends, my nearest and dearest, most valued colleagues and friends, I've met through some form of social media and have not necessarily met face-to-face -face or, as somebody recently said on the Chisakam chat, ITF in the flesh. Um, so there are a lot of people in my life who are significant to me, and uh -huh. I have not met them. Um, sure. The arrow that flips over ha and, and points back to social media interactions, I added that when one of my healthcare colleagues who's in social media looked at it and said, well, you know, you really can enter at any point, and, and actually there's this whole thing that happens where these days, now that social media really is normative in terms of what people use to communicate, mm -hmm. it's also entirely likely that you could go to a conference. Let's go to a, you go to a synod assembly or a meeting at your church, and you have and you meet the person for the first time face to face. And as a in addition to swapping uh, email mm -hmm. email addresses you're probably more likely to say, hey, are you on Twitter or are you on Facebook? Let's follow each other there. Um, so that a face-to-face -face meeting may be the point of entry, and that leads to social sure. media interactions. Now, what this has to do with church is this. When people say, no one in our congregation uses social media, and I don't know, blah, 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 and all that other blah, 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 <laughs> and why should we even use it? I <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Um, <laughs> You know, I'd say, well, if you think of social media as a means, as a tool to connect with your congregants, your staff, your 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 council, mm -hmm. whatever, uh, in between the times you formally gather for worship, you start thinking of it that way, you'll do your yourself a better service and it'll help you understand how to really use it. So the reality is in the world of church, any any time we can, especially if you work for church, mm -hmm. speaking personally, but I 
think I can speak for many others when I say yes. anytime, anytime somebody says we're canceling the meeting, you know, everybody breaks out in the hallelujah chorus. I mean, no <laughs> one really wants to sit in a meeting anymore. And I say, I simply won't do it unless it's an actual working meeting. And even with that, I, I would tend to use, you know, online tools. However, um, so instead of holding everyone in a hostage situation after worship to have a meeting when nobody wants to be there, uh -huh. you can use social media to continue the conversation, to have the committee meeting, to check in and say, whoa, did the invitations go out for the spaghetti dinner? I can't remember. All that can be done online, as can things like, my cat is really sick, will you pray for me? You know, um, prayer requests, reaching out. Um, I have an ongoing conversation with, it started out with Episcopal clergy and I think some EL, ELCA clergy have now chimed in. I have an ongoing conversation about hair and shoes on Twitter. Mm. And it, it's hilarious. Um, so people who look at it suddenly see, oh my God, all these church people, you know, not just running around in collars and albs and whatever. These are church people talking about haircuts. <laughs> real people having real lives. <laughs> you know? The important stuff. You know, <laughs> the important stuff. Well, also, I, this is what I, you know, I always say to people, Twitter's my drug of preference. So, and, and, <laughs> That said, I spend most of my time in consultation saying to local churches, get the hell off of Twitter. You have no business being there. Uh -huh. you really, if you, especially if you don't have a strategy, get off Twitter uh, for your organization. You can be on it individually, however. But sure. um, it's very interesting. I view Twitter as the global, you know, it's kind of like the global living room. Yeah. You look at what happens during TV shows when you have all these people tweeting, oh, my God, can you believe what happened? You know, all that type of stuff. Well, imagine if you use that in the context of church, especially with youth ministry for people who can't travel or can't be there, mm -hmm. and say, oh, my God, you wouldn't believe what I'm hearing now. It's just, you know, I wish you were here, but I'll make it, I'll make it possible for you to be here. Sure. Like tweeting out or posting to Facebook or setting up a group where you can purchase the space. One other thing I would add, and then I'll shut up and you can move on, is, <laughs> and this is a point that's really, really important that I, I just beg, I prayerfully, prayerfully beg people in church to be a lot more open and more articulate about this. As people with disabilities and the homebound, that social media makes participation available to a whole population of people who simply cannot get to church. Mm -hmm. They yeah. cannot physically get, if church is not physically accessible, um, and in some ways it's not even emotionally accessible. Um, so accessibility gets blown wide open by social media. Yeah. And as people of faith wanting to reach out and, and reaching out to those in, those in need and those who cannot participate in normative ways, social media is an absolute blessing. Cool. Well, hey, we've got questions flooding in here. So yeah, I was going to, I was going <laughs> to ask, I was going to ask you about, to say more about the thought bites that are in your book, but I think we should just move on to direct questions. Fine. Um, Go ahead. People, if you haven't picked up this book and you're here because I know that you're interested in what this um, social media gospel has to say. Um, pick it up and you won't be disappointed. I'll tell you that much. Um, so that's my plug <laughs> for this book. Um, because um, some of the questions that are coming in are, what is that strategy, whatever. You find that stuff in the book. So pick up the book um, and, like I said, you won't be disappointed. So are you okay with, if we jump right into questions, Meredith? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Awesome. Um, we um, are supposed to go until 1.30 Central, um, and we're not going to make it. So if um, we discuss that you can stick around for a few more minutes, um, we'll do some housekeeping things when it does come up to our time, um, but then we can dive back into questions. Sound good? Okay. Awesome. Yep. Um, all right. Let's go with... Um, <clears throat> Andy Arnold is wondering... 
Would you replace email exchanges with one-to-one -one exchanges, for example, direct messages on Twitter or private Facebook message, and or phone conversations with one-to-one -one virtual meetings like on Skype or Google Hangout? Oh, that's interesting. You know, let me, this, and this goes to one of the chapters, I am not an auditory learner. Hmm. So probably writing that out would help me hear it better. Uh, so if you could just put that in the, yep. if you could type that out in that little box, Danica, that would help me. So he's asking, would I replace, e say it again, um, email? Would you replace, sorry, I'm trying to, <laughs> um, would you replace it email? exchanges with one-to-one -one, like direct messages on Twitter and Facebook um, and phone conversations with virtual meetings? Um, it, okay, Andy, here's the answer. It depends. And this goes back to the strategy thing. You always, to choose an audience, to choose a, a tool, you have to know your audience. Okay? So what I tell people to do is check in and find out what the preferred mode is. So I'll, I'll ask people, and I encourage other people to ask, ask others, say, would you prefer, to, would you prefer an email mm -hmm. for me, or would you prefer a direct message? Should we do this by phone, or would a virtual meeting be better? Mm -hmm. um, so ask people. You don't make a unilateral decision about what will work. Um, you need to ask the audience. For some people to say, don't ever send me an email, I'm kind of almost at that point. I would rather get a direct <laughs> message, personally. Um, You're a teenager. <laughs> I am. I am. I, I know. I know. A teenager without the zit, thank God. But, yeah, I would rather get a text or I'd rather get a DM. Um, in terms of phone, uh, for meetings, I would rather do Skype. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't, personally cannot stand Google Hangout because I think the tech is very dodgy. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll go to webinars, fine. Go to meetings, fine. Any kind of interface like that, mm -hmm. fine. But again, you need to find out from your audience. If you have eight people out of ten saying, hell no, we're not using that, then you don't use that. Great. All right, this, question, this question comes from Chris. She's wondering, what are some entry-level uses of social media for sharing the gospel that you're seeing? And how about advanced uses? Um, what are you seeing? Entry-level. Yeah, entry-level, meaning like to get you started, sort of uh, elementary kinds of things to share the gospel. Again, you know, everything's going to look back to strategy. Hmm. Here's the universal answer, people. What is your strategy? Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, who is your audience? Mm -hmm. What is your goal? What are your messages? So sharing the gospel, if I were working with you directly, you or your, Chris or your church, I would say, okay, let's unpack this a little bit. How do you define sharing the gospel? Who do you want to share it with? What do you want to say? Where is your audience? And that's a strategy exercise. Mm -hmm. There's no, you don't know what the entry level, you don't know what the entry level tactic is, or even the entry level tool, until you know what the goals are. Now, if the goal is just to share the gospel meaning verses, you know, scripture verses. Mm -hmm. Then there are various ways of doing that, and actually, I think some of the visual social media are the best way to do it these days, um, which would be, you know, create pick words or something like that, something very beautiful, and then tweet it out or post it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a pure broadcast, strat uh, you know, strategy or tactic, actually, of broadcast is not optimal for social media because the, op the operative word in social media is the word social. It means that it helps you form groups, and it's good for building community, creating and building and sustaining community. So, you know, in terms of sharing the gospel, um, my question would be, if by sharing the gospel you're saying, how do I 
build a community around people who understand what the gospel teachings are and then are committed to living it, that's a much more, it's a more robust question to explore. Mm -hmm. And there's not a simple answer like, you know, you're not going to get me to say, oh, start a Twitter account, start tweeting your worship times. Because that might be the worst possible thing you could do. You know, it, it really depends on, on what's going on, uh, what your goals are. Sure. Um, which is why, you know, it does move us back to the thought bites. I mean, one of the things I did for every chapter was I included thought bites, which are, um, there are always three, a trinity of questions um, designed <laughs> for individuals or groups to explore those, those more conceptual issues, um, to think about them more clearly. People want to get tactical and to the tools very quickly. And a lot of people say to me, well, should I be using Twitter? And my answer is, maybe, maybe not. You know, or people say, oh, I love Facebook. I'm going to use it. Or people say, I tried Facebook. It didn't work. And, mm -hmm. I, and I work with a lot of churches and Jewish stories where when I hear this, it didn't work thing, uh -huh. my next question is, what was your strategy? Did you know who your audience was? Did you craft your messages? And what are your goals? They usually look at me like I'm like, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you ask me those questions? Oh, gosh. Oh, I love it. OK, well. Those are essential. Um, thanks for thanks for uh, answering that as best as you could. I'm gonna we're past our time, so I'm gonna do a couple housekeeping things, and then um, for those of you who want to stick around and hear more from Meredith, um, that would be awesome. So hang with me, Meredith. Okay. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, as I said before, this uh, third Tuesday conversation is um, for people who are members of the ELCA Youth Ministry Network, um, and we exist for a reason. Um, and we want to connect people, to educate people, and to, to renew people. Um, being a member of the network gets you lots of different things, and you see those on your screen right now. Um, and one of the ways is we connect during monthly meetings um, for 3TC, and you get to hear from authors who um, know a lot more about these kinds of things than we do, um, which is why we have them here. So um, if you're not a member and you've um, taken advantage of today and you like what you hear, um, the way that you can continue to be a part of this connection and conversation is by becoming a network member. And we have a face-to-face -face gathering where we connect once a year. This year we'll be at the Hyatt Regency in St. Louis. Um, it's in January. Registration is open and filling quickly. So you want to make sure that you uh, make sure that you're a part of that. It's uh, always a great time. So um, go ahead and register from the Youth Ministry Network website. Next month, we'll have um, Navigating Congregational uh, Change and Conflict with Sue and Chris. Um, they own uh, InterServe Ministries, and that'll be on October 15th at 1 o'clock Central, as always. Um, thanks to those of you who, are, who joined us. And you know, see you later if you have to, if you have to go. But if you can stick around, uh, Meredith has agreed to, to stay with us here. So, um, have a great day, and if not, uh, here we go. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, back to questions. Um, let's see here. Um, the one about she, age. Who, yes. How old she, are those people? Um, this comes from Beth. She left the conversation, but um, she's wondering, do you have an idea of how many or what percentage of seniors are involved in social media? Uh, a lot and growing. Um, what I would encourage people to do is uh, go Google Pew Internet um, and look at their, um, their, just get on their, their list, get on their list, or, it's not a list, or, but get on their email list or follow them on Twitter so you can see the latest research findings when it comes up, mm -hmm. when they come up. And what we're finding is that seniors, whatever the hell that means, um, I mean, we don't even know how to define age anymore. Young adults are now considered into their mid-30s. Mm -hmm. um, for the young, uh, the young adult book market, that's considered to mid-30s. When I was growing up, young adults meant like 20-year-olds, OK? So seniors 
hard to say. If you're talking about octogenarian people in their 80s and 90s, chances are they won't really be on social media. They, pro they will be, people in their 80s will be on the web. Don't assume that they're not. Sure. Um, the big shocker, I guess, a year or two was that women in their 50s and older were the largest growing group of people using Facebook, leading to that fabulous joke, Facebook is the party your parents crashed. Um, <laughs> which is why a lot of millennials are now over on Twitter with me. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So okay. you, can't, you can't make assumptions. You right. really cannot make assumptions about who's on it and who's not. Again, when you're working at the judicatory level or at the local church level, you literally have to turn to your congregation and say, who here uses what. And if yeah. you put it in the printed worship bulletin, do that. Put it as a form on your website, do that. Just keep gathering that data. Sure. Um, Great. Um, a question coming in from uh, Beth. Could you point um, her to um, some guidelines for establishing safe practices in uses in social media for youth? I would assume... For she, youth, I, yeah. It, I have a whole appendix on that in the book. Yep. Um, about setting up social media policy, the guidelines you need to use, uh, how you set that up, what you need to include, and in the back there are there's a guide to examples. And hello, first one is ELCA, social media congregations, and there's a link to that. All right. So your church actually provides one of the best, better written, more rigorous sets of guidelines. Um, the headline for it all is use good sense with the subhead, nothing is private. Sure. Sure. There's a couple of questions that have come in about um, the fear of privacy concerns. Um, yeah. And, and I think people forget that there's no such thing as privacy anymore. In, in, there's no such thing as privacy. You have to assume everything is public. At the same time, Facebook is a great example. People freak out about what people find on Facebook. And I look at that and I say, well, let's look at your privacy settings. And I find that they just haven't been configured sure. well at all. So you sure. can lock, I mean, technically, the technical, practical matter, you can lock down these accounts. Um, as a general cultural matter, two things. One is you should never, ever put anything online that you don't, don't want anyone to see ever. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot assume that it's not public. Just don't assume that, which comes under the heading, be smart or put less kindly, don't be stupid. Okay? Right. The, the other issue, which I go on about in the book a little bit, and I think is important, is that the whole notion of what constitutes privacy and discretion has completely changed. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that, again, that's a cultural change. Some of that has to do with the internet, some of it has nothing to do with the internet. But what certain people, what certain generational age cohorts consider private, others just laugh at. So there's a level of, you'll, we'll find a level of self-disclosure sure. among millennials that make, you know, the, the silent generation just gasp, you, you clutch their pearls with TMI. <laughs> yeah, TMI. Whereas, you know, and it, you, and you can't, I mean, you can make some general general assumptions about which age cohort is going to freak out about what, but they're just general assumptions. Sure. Um, and because of the, because of social media, people will put things on social media that they might be less inclined to disclose face to face. I personally don't think that's a bad thing. I think that in some ways social media provides a layer. It's not anonymous because the person's name is there, but it provides a layer of protection um, from scrutiny that you don't have face to face. So if you say to someone, you know, I have a chronic disease, I have a chronic illness, that has me quasi-disabled. Mm -hmm. You say that online, 
there's more safety in saying it online where people maybe respond with, I'm praying for you, oh, that's awful, that sucks, whatever, mm -hmm. as opposed to watching someone recoil mm. or wince when you tell them in person. Sure. So the whole thing about privacy and disclosure, and, you know, and there's a difference between privacy and secrecy. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. I, I personally get nuts when I hear people talk about transparency. My big pushback on that is uh, transparency, what's this, the new buzzword for tell the truth? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, Good. you know, it's, I think it's a fabulous time to, I think it's a fabulous time to do ministry, quite frankly. I think these tools allow us to be bold and honest and free in a way that we haven't been. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, we'll take it, just a couple more questions here. We'll maybe go five more minutes. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, we're not going to be able to get to all these. So, are there best practices for volunteers and lay professionals regarding communication with youth via social media? Um, I think you talk about that a bit in the book of the best practices. Um, appendices. Am I wrong? Yeah. That, well, here's one of my favorite stories about this. Is, again, this is years ago. I think that probably that person is no longer there, and, but, and it was kind of apocryphal for the time. I was meeting with someone who's in charge of youth at a, at a church. I mean, probably the most ill suited person for that job ever. <laughs> um, and this woman says to me very proudly, oh, I, when I get the youth group together, I tell them that the first thing I do is I tell them to turn off their smartphones. No texting, no nothing, no smartphones during youth group. And I looked at her and I said, are you kidding me? I said, now why would you do that? I said, that's how they communicate. Why would you do that? I said, it's best practice. I said, no, you want the people in your youth group to have all their phones on. Because even if they're not inviting people, I mean, you don't know what's going on. You might have somebody saying, okay, youth group sucks but meet me at the church anywhere and we'll go get pizza. Uh -huh. You want that to happen. You want those interactions to happen. They might actually wander into the church and see that it's not as awful as they thought it was going to be. Hmm. You know. So best practice, let them keep their phones on. Best, best practice, teach them to turn the ringers off. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Phones are so disruptive. I said, well, sure, if everybody hears you playing, I'm too sexy for my whatever. <laughs> Turn the ringer off. <laughs> I love it. Um, this question's coming in from Elizabeth. Uh, how can social media be a tool for faith formation? Oh, okay. Great question. Well, I like uh, Facebook groups for faith formation exercises. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially either in an open group or a closed group, I always recommend closed groups for ministry areas where it's very, very tender, like uh, you know anything having to do with grief or really personal stuff where mm -hmm. people need to know that they can share and not in public. But um, part of it in terms of how you use social media for faith formation the question is, well, how do you use anything for faith formation? So the question is, what are the questions you ask? How, are, how do you invite people into a conversation or a personal inquiry about their faith? How would you do that anyway? Mm -hmm. And then do that on social media, and then you have to accommodate it. So let's say you, if you're meeting with a group, your question would be something like, when have, where did you see Christ today? Okay. Or how do you know you're in the presence of God? Uh -huh. How do you, or, you know, those types of questions. Those are easy to put into 140 characters on Twitter. Those are really easy to post on Facebook with an image that would support it. Those are easy ways to do, you know, easy things to do. So I just say, look at, look at what you would do in a face-to-face -face setting, because whatever you do in ministry face-to-face, -face, you can do on social media. You just have to tweak it sure. for the technology, and that's all. Yeah. 
cool. It's about training ourselves to um, to to use other platforms. Exactly, and then understanding how the other platforms work in the sense that I spend a lot of time on Twitter going through the back channel, which means going privately, DM or whatever, saying to people, what you put up is you cannot retweet your tweet. It's too long. Ah. Or I model how to, when I retweet something, I put up what I put M. If you see one of my tweets and it says MT, that means that's a convention for modified tweet which means I edited the original tweet so it's retweetable. Uh -huh. So I do a lot of that on Twitter to teach people how do you put up tweets that people can read given the media and given the medium and how can they retweet it. So that, but again, that's technical stuff. That's 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 training. Sure. Absolutely. Um I'm I'm bummed that um, Hans Wiersma is a professor at a college here in Minneapolis. He's left the conversation, I assume, probably because he had to get to a class or something. But um, we didn't get to his, um, I don't know that I could call it a question, but this is archived um, so he could come back and listen to it later. Um, he says, according to biographer McLuhan, preferred, uh, according to a biographer, McLuhan preferred the Roman Catholic Mass because it was primarily visual. He thought speech, print, electronic media distance people from God and each other. He was a daily communicant. Um, wondering what you think of McLuhan's view. Look, no one's saying, no one I know, neither I nor any of my colleagues who work in this, in this particular ministry is saying that digital replaces in the flesh. Mm -hmm. No one is saying that. It's both and, sure. not either or. Um, what we receive, um, I mean, just like this, you can't do virtual communion uh, in terms of Eucharist. I mean, what you receive as you gather together as a physical community and come to the table is different than what you receive when you gather as a community online. Mm -hmm. It's not better, it's not worse, it's different. Great. And so I, I just think it's, um, it's, a, it's a fun academic argument. It's probably one of those, ooh, let's all get drunk or stoned and talk about whether this makes any sense type of argument. But as a practical matter, I, I just, dismiss it as that's fun but that really has nothing to do with what's going on in the world of social media because no one's saying replace it. Right. No right. replacement. Great. So why are we having this conversation? If you want to have it for fun, I'll have it for fun, but then you gotta buy me chocolate. <laughs> if you want to have it seriously <laughs> if you want to have it seriously because you think anybody thinks that we're gonna completely get rid of churches and, and, and mass and Eucharist and liturgy and worship, I'm not gonna have that conversation because that's not what we're talking about next. Sure. But that's just me. You know, I get a little cranky about this stuff. Awesome. I love it. Um, hey, we've come to the end well, again, <laughs> to the end of our extended time. Um, <laughs> Yet another ending. Yeah. I love it. Well, we Thank you so much. Life, right? Thank you so much for um, offering uh, your insight on this subject um, with us and for being a guest. Um, I hope that people um, engage you in conversation um, on Twitter and um, in other various forms of social media that you're a part of. But most importantly, I hope people pick up your book. Um, it's a great, a great resource. So. Um, Thank you so much. Um, thanks, everybody, um, for joining us on 3TC. This will be archived um, on the Third Tuesday website through the Youth Ministry Network web page. And um, so you can uh, use it uh, at your own discretion from here on out. Um, invite Meredith into the conversation that you're having uh, in your congregations or in your own brain. Don't let it stay there. Um, she'd love to have the conversation with you. So um, thanks again, and I hope that you have a great day. We'll see you right back here next month on October 15th. Uh, until then, take care.